Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December 2022 version of UMDF's Bench to Bedside uh, Seminar. Uh, for those of you joining us live, thank you for making time for this clinical trial update this busy time of year. If you're watching this later on demand, we appreciate your making the time to learn about clinical trials and to be up to date on what, what is happening in the mitochondrial uh, disease space. Uh, before we get uh, started, just a few things I'd like to mention. Uh, first was the genetic testing program uh, that we uh, launched earlier this year. This is a clinician-facing program. Um, a special hello to uh, patients and families that have joined us today. Uh, this is not a program designed for you uh, to directly order, participate in, but please uh, do make your uh, healthcare provider aware of it. Uh, if you do not have a genetic diagnosis, as we're going to learn today, Diagnosis is a critical component of your optimal clinical care, but also the ability to participate in clinical research. So uh, please follow the link shown on the screen to learn more about that. All right, so to get us started, um, myself and Dr. Amel Kara are going to be your uh, moderators uh, for today's event. Again, the goal of this is to share with everyone updates on current clinical trial activity, but also uh, provide the opportunity for organizations that are planning uh, clinical trials to share some information as well. Uh, this is a really uh, exciting time. I'm really thrilled that we have the uh, slate of speakers here we do. I think most of you know we typically do this once a year uh, at our in-person meeting, at the mitochondrial medicine meeting, but given the level of activity, our thought was we need to be doing this more frequently. And our commitment to you as we head into 2023 is there's going to be an increased amount of clinical, clinical research, clinical trial programming, UMDF making available so that we can all work together to improve our clinical trial readiness and truly create a culture of clinical trials as that is the pathway to treatments and cures for mitochondrial disease. So let me get started um, with just sharing a few of the tools that we have available through UMDF to help with that. This is particularly oriented towards the patients and patient families. Of course, on our website, if you go to umdf.org slash clinical dash trials, that's the main page where you have a number of resources available to you. I particularly emphasize educational resources and the understanding that for many of you, there isn't a full understanding of what it means to participate in a clinical trial or what the drug development process looks like. We've uh, created a, a full suite of resources there where you can educate yourself at your own pace, FAQs that really summarize some of the key, uh, key points. But also importantly, active trials are very prominently displayed so that if you want to get right to it and find out where there may be a trial that you or a loved one is eligible for, please click on those to find out more. So let's go down. There's a couple more pages though that we have available. You'll also find on the next slide, please, our clinical trials finder. So this is actually embedded on the page and is meant to be a guided tour of sorts where you can answer questions uh, and based on your questions, the tool will try to present to you clinical trials, clinical studies, that are relevant to you or your loved one's situation. So it's a very powerful tool and a nice way to investigate uh, what is available to you. Importantly, as you move through that, uh, when relevant studies are presented, sites and mechanisms for contacting the sponsors of the clinical trial are included in those. So this is a great way to get drilled down on what's relevant to you, but also what's going on around me so that you can explore uh, uh, options available to you. And then thirdly, next slide, please, um, is our therapeutic pipeline, which we're really just updating on the website right now, but we encourage everybody to go check it out. So again, if you go through the, the link shown there, this is more oriented towards based on um, condition or type of mitochondrial disease, recognizing that quite often for patients or patient families, you have heard a diagnosis from your doctor and you really wanna kind of start from there to know what kind of activity is taking place that's most relevant to me. So this is just another way of exploring where there are clinical trials, 
what's taking place right now, what might be relevant to you. When there's a trial that is actively recruiting, there will be a link presented right next to, to that case where you can directly uh, find out more information about how to participate in that. All right, um, I think that's it from this side. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanna wrap up um, by, by reminding everyone that UMDF stewards a patient registry uh, for mitochondrial disease called MitoShare. And MitoShare is a really important component of the clinical trial landscape. This is the place where we can identify patients, where we can characterize the patients from your perspective as a patient or a caregiver of a patient so that as clinical trials develop, we know who's there, we know where you're located, and we can make you aware of, of relevant clinical trial opportunities. So if you haven't had a chance yet to register for it, I ask you to consider it. Uh, it's another way that you can contribute to helping create the culture of clinical trials that we're looking to create for mitochondrial disease. Uh, and to those of you who have, thank you very much and look forward to continuing to develop that as we head into 2023. All right, I think with that, on the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Dr. Malkara, uh, from our Scientific and Medical Advisory Board, who's just going to give an overview of the therapeutic pipeline, since we won't have an update on every intervention that's in develop, every drug in development right now, before we head into the specific updates. So, Dr. Kara, turn it over to you. Thank you, Phil, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming today to hear about our clinical trial updates. This is a pipeline that Phil and I have been up, trying to keep up to date, um, and it's been exciting to see how much it's been changing more rapidly than um, prior years. As you can see here, there are at least 11 uh, drug developers that are actively pursuing drug therapy in mitochondrial disease, and there are many more that are in earlier stages of drug development. We have several uh, programs that are already in phase three and phase two trials, and several are in earlier stages of development that we are uh, critically following and um, collaborating with. Um, as you can see here, the mechanism of actions of the drugs that are in development is uh, pretty wide, and it ranges from gene therapy to cardiolipin modification, redox um, uh, reduction to nitric oxide modulation. So it, it's very important to see a rich, uh, a, a rich um, variety of uh, mechanisms of action of these drugs being used because we, we think that that's what it's going to take to really cure and treat mitochondrial disease, that it's going to be, a, a, there's a need for a combination of several therapy that act on the different aspects of the pathophysiology of mitochondrial disease. As you can also see in the mitochondrial disease indication, the diseases that are being targeted are either large uh, groups of disorders represented by cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, myopathy, mitochondrial myopathy in general, or specific uh, drug um, targeting like TK2 deficiency with its specific diox <clears throat> dioxynucleosy therapy. Um, what we are seeing in the field is that there is um, more prominence of adult um, clinical trials in the mitochondrial disease field, as opposed to pediatric um, mitochondrial Ooh. disease therapies. And that remains a large area of unmet need. Um, but we're very hopeful that uh, there is more interest in pediatric clinical trials coming in the future. And um, today we are going to hear from several of these uh, drug developers listed here. And we are going to start our talks today by hearing from Rainy McCarthy, President and CEO of Stealth Biotherapeutics. Rainy. Thanks, Jamal. I appreciate that. Let me pull up my slides to share. Um, just want to say, you know, it's delighted to be closing out the year with the UMDF Mito community. Um, it's, it's great to be here and, and to update you on what we're doing at Stealth Biotherapeutics, um, including with respect to our new power clinical trial, which is a phase three clinical trial in mitochondrial myopathy. So my goal today is to leave you with a few key takeaways and I'll preview those for you up front. Um, we're very committed to this patient community. We've been developing mitochondrial targeted therapeutics for over 15 years. Um, our lead compound, elamipratine, 
has demonstrated proof of mitochondrial uh, engagement um, it, by improving clinical endpoints, so how patients function or feel in multiple studies, including in primary mitochondrial myopathy. And so with that, we've been able to learn from our past trials which patients are most likely to respond to alimipratide therapy, um, how long we should be treating patients in our clinical trials, and what endpoints we should choose. So for example, our Phase three clinical trial in mitochondrial myopathy, which is new power, which is currently recruiting patients, was really designed based on all these learnings from prior placebo controlled clinical trials. Um, so I think that from that perspective, we've really tried to design this trial for success. So with alimipratide, our lead compound, we have exposed over 1,400 patients to alimipratide. Um, patients, in particularly those with Barth syndrome, have been on therapy for more than four years. Uh, those are once daily subcutaneous injections. We've learned important lessons. Um, this is why we do clinical trials, is so we can learn how drugs work in people and what people they can best benefit. So we see in non-clinical models that elamipratide has a very rapid effect within hours on cells and in mitochondria. But its effect on organ systems um, that have been damaged over time in chronic genetic diseases seems to continue to um, expand. So, for example, in the setting of Barth syndrome, we see uh, cardiac improvements, so improvements in heart function, you know, starting earlier in the trial and really continuing to improve over four years on therapy. So again, all of this helps us design better, smarter clinical trials and really target our trials to enroll the patients who we think can most benefit. So we have observed clinical evidence in people of target engagement in multiple patient populations. Um, in Barth syndrome, which I just mentioned, we've seen improvement in cardiac function as well as in exercise tolerance and fatigue. In our clinical program in mitochondrial myopathy, we did have a pre-identified subgroup of patients, which were patients with nuclear genetic mutations, whose exercise tolerance improved in what I think was the largest ever placebo-controlled clinical trial conducted to date in that disease. And in geographic atrophy, which is a disease of aging, we've also seen the potential for elamibratide to improve vision for patients. So I'll talk a little bit about Barth syndrome. It, this is a primary mitochondrial disease. It is a particularly lethal primary mitochondrial disease. Uh, children with Barth syndrome, 85% of them die by the age of five. For those that survive early infancy and childhood, we see declining cardiac function over time so that most of these patients will die a cardiac death by their third or fourth decade of life. What you're looking at here is stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that our heart pumps out with every beat. And that's really important to bring oxygen and energy to organ systems like the skeletal muscle system. So this very poor stroke volume in bar syndrome, which gets worse as these patients get older, likely contributes to the exercise intolerance and fatigue in this patient population. After four years of elamipratide therapy in this ultra rare disease, we see early improvements in cardiac function that continue to improve over time, so that by the end of four years of therapy, we're seeing a greater than 40% improvement in left ventricular stroke volume um, as compared to baseline for these patients. And that was closely associated with improvements in this patient population in exercise tolerance and muscle strength. What you're looking at here is open label data from our study compared to a natural history control. So this was a phase three natural history comparative control study where we see that the improvements of over 100 meters in six minute walk, for example, um, would not be predicted in the natural course of this disease. We've also had some longer term experience in patients with nuclear um, genetic defects leading to primary mitochondrial myopathy. So there were some case studies from our expanded access program, which were shared at the UMDF conference last spring. You're looking here at work that Mary Kay Koenig and colleagues did with a couple of patients with essentially SANDO, um, which is a primary mitochondrial myopathy due to nuclear genetic defects, where these patients did experience improved ambulation on elamipratide therapy. And similarly, out of Amy Goldstein and Marnie Falk and the, the team at CHOP, um, looking at five patients with nuclear genetic mutations in expanded access, where they concluded that they observed improvement in physical outcomes for their patients, as well as evidence um, for the safety of elamipratide in treating this patient population. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about our new power clinical trial because this is currently a phase three clinical trial enrolling patients with primary mitochondrial myopathy due to nuclear genetic mutations. Many will know that we ran a program, a large program in mitochondrial myopathy, which was our MM Power 3 clinical study. And in that, we enrolled 59 patients who had nuclear genetic mutations. And that was the pre specified subgroup of patients who responded to therapy in that phase three clinical trial. You can see that patients um, with these nuclear genetic mutations, randomized to alamipertide, improved by 25 plus meters in their six minute walk distance relative to the placebo treated patients. When we brought this data to the experts in the mitochondrial disease community, like Amel and others, to ask how we should design our next effort, they encouraged us to essentially enrich this trial for patients who have clear skeletal muscle involvement as the primary manifestation of their disease. And the way to do that for these patients is to focus on ocular muscle involvement. So when we really take another cut of that data from the prior phase three, looking at patients who have ophthalmoplegia, um, so involving the ocular muscles, you can see that between group distance um, in 45 meters gets even greater. So this was a way for us to really enrich the current new power clinical trial to enroll the patients most likely to respond to therapy. Why is it that these nuclear genetic mutations may be more responsive to alamipertide therapy. Um, we know, for example, that for skeletal muscle function, mitochondrial DNA replication is extremely important to make more mitochondria to provide the energy that our muscle system needs. And most of that mitochondrial DNA replication is controlled by nuclear genes. So again, our phase three clinical trial is currently enrolling patients. We're looking for patients with nuclear genetic mutations um, leading to primary mitochondrial myopathy, again, with ocular muscle involvement, um, which is essentially ophthalmoplegia. We've initiated multiple states in the US as well as globally to try to make this trial easier for patients to access. So you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, the sites that are currently recruiting throughout the US, and we have a handful of additional sites that we're expecting to have up and recruiting patients um, in the coming weeks. And so our goal again would be to get this study fully enrolled um, first half of next year, and that's what we're currently tracking for. Um, more information about this study is available at clinicaltrials.gov. Overall, as Amel noted, we are um, developing our drug elamipertide as well as our pipeline compounds for a number of diseases of mitochondrial dysfunction, um, certainly Barth syndrome and mitochondrial myopathy, as well as Friedrich's ataxia, where we have trials ongoing. And with our next generation compound, which was essentially designed to improve um, brain penetration, we're targeting patients with ALS. So again, just to leave you with a few key messages, elamipertide has been uh, dosed in multiple clinical trials. It's been well tolerated with injection site reactions, the most common adverse event. Um, multiple trials with elamipertide have demonstrated clinical signals of mitochondrial target engagement. That includes patients with primary mitochondrial myopathy due to nuclear genetic mutations. And our new power uh, trial was optimized from learnings from our prior programs um, so that we could enroll the right patients who might be most likely to derive benefit from elamipertide therapy. Happy holidays to everyone. It was great to join you today. Thank you so much, Rainey. Our next speaker is Alex Dornmo. He is the Chief Medical Officer at Reneo um, Pharmaceuticals. Alex, are you yeah, here? Yeah, I'm a... Hi. Can you all see uh, yes. my slides? Yes, we can. Hi. Um, before I talk about Reneo, I want to say a couple of words about UMDF. I, I, I think that it's clearly not fun to have a disease like a mitochondrial disease, but the resource that UMDF provides and the commitment to trying to find treatments for, for patients with these diseases is, is incredible. So, so I'm 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 very very proud to be part of of this and and uh, and I I don't know how one could do this without the UMDF. So so kudos to all of you for for being here and for doing the work that you do. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, what we are doing at Reneo and uh, many of you may 
uh, remember that uh, Reneo is developing a P par delta agonist. Uh, uh, P par delta agonists are uh, drugs that stimulate the, the, the transcription, the formation of the proteins that form the mitochondria and that help the mitochondria function well. And uh, by uh, improving the mitochondrial uh, uh, formation and, 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 uh, and activity, one can increase the function of the mitochondria. And the main function of the mitochondria that is affected in patients with PMM is this oxidative phosphorylation, which is the, the oxidation, the, the, the metabolism of fats to generate energy in the cell. Reno-01 is the medicine we are developing. It is a once daily uh, oral medicine. Uh, and we're evaluating this, this drug in patients with primary mitochondrial myopathy. Uh, um, let me advance to the next slide. Um, oops. So you may all be aware that we are doing a, a pivotal study. Uh, this is the STRIDE study. We had previously done a phase one trial uh, where we saw a very strong signal of response in patients with PMM. And uh, based on the results of that study, we designed this uh, study that is the pivotal trial. Uh, pivotal means that if the results of this trial are uh, satisfactory, if they go, if they are positive, we would be able to use the information of this study to make an application to the FDA and other regulatory agencies for approval of the drug uh, and use in patients with PMM. That is provided that other uh, aspects of the medicine are also satisfied. And the main one is, as you all know, that, that the drug is safe and well tolerated in patients with, with PMM as well. So this study includes 200 patients and we are focusing in the other population uh, that, that the, that stealth is, is not studying right now. That is the patients with mitochondrial gene uh, defects. Um, I will talk a little bit about our plants in nuclear gene defects as well. Uh, the study is for adults 18 years and older, and uh, we wish we could study children in, uh, as well, but at this point, the combination of children and adults in one clinical trial introduces a lot of noise and difficulty in interpreting the results because the progression of the disease, how the disease evolves is very different in adults and in children. So mixing and matching them together makes it very difficult to interpret the results. And uh, of course, patients who participate in the test we, uh, we, we, the, the, in the study must be able to walk in by themselves, either with a walker or with help, but by themselves, because the main measure of outcome in this study is a 12 minute walk test. Uh, patients that participate in this trial, this is a roughly six months trial, uh, uh, get divided by, by chance to receive either the medicine or a placebo for the total of 24 weeks. You have a one-to-one -one chance of getting either the drug, the, the active drug or the placebo, that's a 50% chance. And uh, we are also measuring other things in this trial to make sure that this drug works well for patients. So we're, we have a, a series of questionnaires where we explore how is fatigue evolving, what is the response to treatment and what is the quality of life on treatment versus not on treatment uh, to be able to, to, to put together a package for, 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 for the approval of the drug. And then patients who complete this study can continue to receive Reno-01 in an open label extension study. It's called the Stride Ahead study. This study is currently not open in the United States, but it's open in the rest of the world. This is because of regulations that the FDA has that don't permit us to open the study yet in the US. But our commitment is that patients who participate in our study, eventually when the, when the Stride Ahead study can open in the US, will have access to the medicine uh, uh, as part of, of, of this uh, extension study. And uh, we obviously hope that we can do this as soon as possible. Now, a lot, a lot of people ask me the question, why are you guys using a 12 minute walk test instead of a six minute walk test, which is what everyone else uses. And I think that this graph here explains why we chose the 12 minute walk test. This is a graph that shows 
what sources of energy the muscle uses as it engages in physical activity. So when you start moving, and this is true for everybody, whether you have PMM or not, when you start moving, your muscle will quickly use phosphocreatine, which is a readily available source of energy in the muscle. But that source of energy only lasts for a couple of minutes at most. And as that is depleting, as that is going down, the muscle starts using sugar glycogen that is contained within the muscle. That's the yellow line you see there. And that lasts for around six to eight minutes as the mitochondria are beginning to do fatty acid oxidation. That is metabolizing, using the fats to generate energy. And that's the blue line. And then the fatty acid metabolism, the use of these fats is what sustains exercise over a long period of time. And that blue line is the one that is most affected in patients with PMM. So we think that doing a six minute walk test may show improvement in patients with PMM because there is some contribution of fatty acids to the energy supply in the first few minutes. But as you can see, it's probably most impactful. The, the effect will be more important in the second six minutes of the test. So that's why we chose to do a 12 minute walk test. We think that is a test that captures better the response of the, of, of, of the body to a medicine that improves the mitochondrial function. Now, we, uh, we, we, we are doing this study in multiple in countries. In fact, there are 14 countries participating in the trial besides the United States. We have Canada, the United Kingdom, several countries in Europe as well, Australia and, and New Zealand. And we have enrolled, if you, if you recall, I mentioned that we are enrolling 200 patients in the study. We've already enrolled more than 80% of the patients in the study. But enrolling patients in this study has been very, very difficult for several reasons. First, PMM is, is not as common a disease as, for example, diabetes or hypertension, where there are millions of people with those diseases. Second, we're coming out of the COVID pandemic, and that has made it very difficult for patients to participate in trials. And third, some of these trials are very difficult to do, and some patients have trouble participating in coming to the clinic for the visits. And we know that that is a commitment that is required, but we really need your help to complete this study. We're in the final stretch, and the sooner we finish enrolling this study, the faster we will be able to read the results and then really know whether this medicine is likely to be of help to patients or not in the future. Um, by the way, the first patient in the open label long-term study enrolled in, in early 2022. So we already have some experience with patients being treated for more than one year with this, with this, with this medicine. And, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, to, today, the, the, we haven't observed any major toxicities or problems with safety. So, so we're very excited about, about the prospects of, of, of this drug. And we're very excited about the possibility of being able to complete the enrollment as soon as possible so that we can follow the last few patients for, for six months and, 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 uh, and be able to see the results of the trial. We're also finalizing plans to evaluate the effect of Reno one in, PM, in PMM patients with nuclear gene defects. And we have announced publicly in our company that in the early part of, of, of next year, just in a few weeks from now, hopefully, we'll be able to, to, uh, to, to talk to all of you about plans on how we, we think that, that it will be best to study our medicine in patients with nuclear gene defects and PMM. And we're committed to that, and we will very soon be able to open a, a trial where patients will have the opportunity uh, to participate if they have nuclear gene defects. And we are aware that patients with PMM have several opportunities to participate in clinical research and uh, the STRIDE study and all of our studies that we design are designed to be very uh, patient friendly. Uh, we, we offer uh, usually in all of our trials, we offer uh, lodging if you, if you live 
relatively far from the clinic so that you can stay near the clinic for your clinic visit. We offer transportation. We even have a concierge service where you just call this concierge is like a travel agency that uh, helps you set up all, all, all the communications. And whenever we can do a visit at home, we, we try to do that as well. So, so mm -hmm. uh, in short, uh, I think that we are at the, uh, at, at the uh, final push of enrolling the study and we really need your help to find a few more patients uh, so that we can complete the trial. And if you all have any questions, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, uh, that's probably the best source to look at objective information provided by all of the companies that are that are or and all of the researchers that are doing research in the field of PMM. Um, in 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 the little box where it says other terms, you can put REN001, and that will pop out a, a list of, of studies that we're doing, and including the, the, the stride and the stride ahead study. And that will tell you a lot of information about the trials that will allow you to decide whether this may be the right trial for you or not. I want to thank again the, the UMDF for giving us the opportunity to share this information with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with all of you in 2023. Thank you so much, Alex. It's exciting to hear that you're reaching the final stretch. Our next speaker is Matt Klein, the Chief Operating Officer at PTC Therapeutics. Great. Thank you very much, Amal. It's, as always, a pleasure to be here and to be able to share updates with the community. Obviously, we've been working with Vitiquinone uh, for many years and have formed so many great partnerships, uh, most importantly with patients and families, but with, also with physicians, with UMDF and other foundations. And again, we are so grateful for the partnership we've been able to enjoy over so many years in our efforts to move Vitiquinone forward for patients with mitochondrial disease. PT, for those who don't know PTC, we are a global company that discovers and develops and commercializes therapies specifically for patients with rare disorders. We were founded in 1998 with that purpose, use innovative science to develop important and meaningful therapies for patients with rare disorders who desperately need drugs. Over the past 25 years, we've grown quite a bit, now with a footprint in over 50 countries and over 1,300 employees, but we remain firmly committed to developing therapies for patients with rare disorders. We have built a large and broad portfolio, taking advantages of many different scientific approaches to develop therapies for many, many different disorders. But today, of course, we're focused on our BioE platform with vitiquinone, our lead therapy. Vitiquinone has been in development for a number of years. Its target is the enzyme 15 lipoxygenase, which is an important regulator of the oxidative stress and inflammation pathways that are key to mitochondrial disease progression and symptoms. By targeting 15 lipoxygenase, we're able to decrease oxidative stress, decrease inflammation, and increase the levels of critical antioxidants that are very important to preserving cell health and well being. Vitiquinone is orally administered. It can be given in capsule form or an oral solution, which is very useful for patients that have feeding tubes. And over the past years, we've collected a number of different regulatory designations, including a number of orphan designations, as well as an FDA fast track designation. At this time, vitiquinone is in clinical studies, a phase two, three study for patients with mitochondrial disease and associated seizures, and a phase three study for patients with Friedreich ataxia. Over 500 patients have been treated with vitiquinone, and we now just passed the longest consecutive treatment of 13 years in a boy with surf one lee syndrome. I want to focus our discussion today on our MIDI study, which is a phase 2-3 study of vitiquinone in patients with mitochondrial disease-associated seizures. Over the past several studies, we've been able to generate a large amount of evidence which really supports developing vitiquinone for mitochondrial disease-associated uh, seizures. We've, from our compassionate use studies, we've had reports in patients with several different disease subtypes, such as alpers bolgi MELAS, complex three deficiency, and Lee syndrome, all of whom have demonstrated improvements in seizure symptomology. In addition, in our Lee syndrome 
trial, we were able to demonstrate that there was a reduction in the seizure frequency items that were part of the Newcastle Pediatric Mitochondrial Disease Score. So this gave us important evidence that vitiquinone could potentially improve the symptom of refractory seizures in patients with mitochondrial disease. We also conducted a case series in five children with pontocerebellar hypoplasia type 6, which is a rare mitochondrial disorder that's characterized by severe seizures. We treated five children, and we were able to demonstrate in these five children a marked reduction in seizure frequency, a prevention of status epilepticus, and importantly, a decrease in disease-related morbidity, including a reduction in disease-related hospitalizations from an average of 56 days per year in the year prior to initiating vitiquinone to zero days in the hospital in, at years two and three uh, for patients. In addition, we were able to do a very careful natural history study where we could demonstrate a clear mortality benefit uh, in patients treated with vitiquinone relative to natural history. So we used all of these data and important learnings gathered over previous vitiquinone studies to construct the MITEI study, which as I mentioned, is a registrational trial of vitiquinone for mitochondrial disease associated seizures. We have successfully enrolled this study, and it's taken a great effort uh, by our investigator and patient communities worldwide. We have study sites in the United States, in Europe, in, in France, Italy, Poland, Spain, and Sweden, in the UK, as well as Japan. The study is designed as a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, and we had in target enrollment of 60 subjects, and we were actually able to over-enroll uh, the study. The study includes a one-month observational run-in where all subjects who are screened are observed and the number of observable motor seizures are counted, uh, and then subjects who have a certain, criteria, a certain number of observable motor seizures are then randomized to receive vitiquinone or placebo for six months. At the end of the placebo control phase, all subjects will then receive vitiquinone for an additional 48 weeks during an open-label extension phase of the trial. The key inclusion criteria for the trial include age less than 18 years, a genetic confirmation of inherited mitochondrial disease, evidence of seizure activity despite treatment with two different anti-epileptic drugs, documented history of epilepsy associated with mitochondrial disease, and a stable regimen of anti-epileptic therapies, as well as a stable regimen of dietary supplements prior to enrollment. The key endpoints in the study, the primary endpoint is the change in observable motor seizures during that six-month placebo control phase relative to that run-in observational phase, the use of rescue medications, the number of hospitalizations, and quality of life. As I mentioned, we're incredibly proud to have this study fully enrolled. It was, a, it was quite a challenge initiating this study during COVID. Uh, as we know, for patients with mitochondrial disease to participate in clinical trials is always challenging. Travel to study sites is very, very difficult, and this was even more so the case during the pandemic. Uh, we made the commitment to initiate this study during the pandemic because, as everyone knows, mitochondrial disease did not take a break because we were in COVID, and we wanted to do the best we can to get this trial going and move this program forward through a tremendous effort of our internal teams, as well, again, as our collaborations with the patient communities globally and our physician network, we were able to not only enroll this study, but actually over-enroll this study, and we're great, incredibly grateful for that. We look forward to sharing results from this study in the first quarter of 2023. So again, thank you all very much for your continued partnership, and I wish everyone a happy and healthy holiday season and new year. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, our next speaker is Fernando Scaglia. He's a professor of molecular and human genetic at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, thank you, Emil. And uh, hopefully you can uh, uh, you can actually see my slides now. We can. Uh, yeah. So um, thank you for the kind of opportunity of presenting um, uh, this, this trial, the sibling trial is a phase one. Um, uh, sibling trial, they, those escalation, those finding for uh, Mila syndrome. Um, as we know, uh, Mila stands for mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis with a stroke-like episode, and um, 
and the most common pathogenic variant is the 3 to 4 3 a to g transition in mttl1 uh, it has been hypothesized that uh, one of the uh, you know major um, you know, ideologies of the metabolic strokes that we can see here that affect, I mean, patients with MILAS is the altered metabolism of uh, nitric oxide. And, and that uh, could be linked to mitochondrial proliferation, which is found in uh, smooth muscle and endothelial cells of small blood vessels, which we can see here on the panel on the left, seen as vessels surrounded by the intense blue or succinate dehydrogenase uh, histochemistry. Uh, so in the uh, let's see in the next slide, uh, which uh, I'm trying to um, yes um, for some reason let me let me do this. Hopefully you can see. So in the next slide, um, so we do see here um, how uh, nitric oxide synthase will use arginine as a substrate. Uh, nitric oxide will be produced, and as an end result. Uh, we have um, citrulline, and it's known that it's certain uh, cellular, um, certain tissues, certain cellular types. Citrulline co-localizes with nitric oxide synthase, and two enzymes of the urea cycle, arginine-succinate synthase and arginine-succinate lyase, to produce a de novo synthesis of arginine. Um, it has also been found that um, at least in the initial observations by Koga in Japan, that IV arginine supplementation led to clinical improvement if given within three hours of the onset of symptoms associated with metabolic strokes. And then there was another report coming from Columbia in New York uh, about hypocitrullinemia reported in uh, patients with, uh, with MILAS. Um, therefore, initially, before launching this trial, we actually conducted uh, stable isotope studies uh, in um, adults and children with MILAS with the same common mutation, M3243A2G. And they, we have three hypotheses that uh, they would have impaired nitric oxide production rate, then both arginine and citrulline supplementation would increase nitric oxide production, and that citrulline supplementation would increase nitric oxide production to a higher degree than arginine supplementation. And that could be due to different factors. There is, after all, um, arginase expressed in the gut that would break down um, and degrade um, oral arginine. And uh, moreover, if arginine is given orally, is subjected to uh, first pass metabolism in the liver, that doesn't happen with citrulline. And then what was, was alluded in the previous slide, citrulline co-localizes with nitric oxide synthase, ASS and ASL, to channel a more efficient production of arginine through that de novo pathway. Um, so we found indeed, and that was actually published, that actually patients have impaired nitric oxide production compared to controls, uh, that both arginine and citrulline improve uh, nitric oxide production, and citrulline is more efficient than arginine in restoring nitric oxide uh, production. Therefore, uh, this was actually like an um, earlier pilot study funded by, uh, by, by NAMDEC and NIH funds. So this is an NIH-funded phase one uh, clinical trial. Um, we had to obtain an IND for citrulline uh, from FDA. Uh, the trial was approved by NIH, and this is the NCT number. Uh, these are the inclusion criteria, clinical diagnosis, uh, either like neurological features or muscular symptoms, stroke-like events, seizures, exercise intolerance, fatigue, or any combination of this. Um, FDA approved the trial just to be done in adults aged to six, 18 to 65 years and with the common mutation 3243A2G and MTTL1. Uh, these individuals have to have an elevated plasma lactate at the baseline, and they also have, they have to have the capacity to consent. Uh, and so therefore, a Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test is administered before these individuals um, are presented with a consent form, and there has to be a score of 26 or higher, and a cessation of arginine, citrulline, or compounds affecting nitric oxide one week prior to the study. Um, the primary aim here, this is a safety study, is to uh, evaluate the maximum tolerated dose of L-citrulline. And uh, this is the initial number, 24, uh, 24 uh, adults with MILAS at one of the following doses, 
10 grams, 20 grams, 30 grams, or 40 grams divided four times a day for up to one month with an additional month follow-up and with an exit visit at week eight. The subjects are enrolled one at a time, seriously, serially uh, following the um, a statistical um, algorithm and they receive L-citrulline for up to one month or until there is a dose limiting toxicity. The primary safety outcomes of those limiting toxicities will be uh, connected with any effects of uh, having uh, nitric oxide, um, an excess of nitric oxide, such as orthostatic hypotension, um, headaches, um, hypoglycemia, um, or nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. And the secondary aims is to determine uh, doing research MRI, cerebral blood flow, and cerebrovascular reactivity using arterial spin labeling MRI. And we monitor plasma amino acids and guanidino compounds to evaluate if there is arginine toxicity by uh, untargeted metabolomic uh, analysis. The trial uh, currently is in full motion. It has been very, it was very challenging um, to uh, recruit patients during the different waves of COVID-19, but now the trial is moving ahead at full speed and the NIH and IRB approved protocol. There is full engagement and watchfulness from our clinical and statistical teams. We have weekly meetings with the uh, data monitoring coordinating center at Infontaine, as well as the statistical team from uh, NAMDEC from Columbia University and under the guidance of our data safety monitoring board. So now nine participants have been enrolled in the study. Um, uh, seven participants have completed the study. Uh, so BCM008 finished week four visit and BCM009 finished baseline visit. And we have now two potential participants that actually are interested in the study and one of them will be coming in uh, January. So that will be our participant uh, number 10. So we are actively uh, recruiting um, and uh, the information has been posted, uh, is also posted in the NIH uh, website and our clinical research coordinator is happy to take any calls. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernando, so much. Our next speaker is Magnus Hansen. He is the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Preclinical and Clinical Development at Apliva. Thank you, Amel. And, and thanks to the UMDF team uh, uh, for arranging this uh, uh, clinical trial update. Do you, do you see my uh, slides? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so as Amel said, I'm Chief Medical Officer at Abliva, and we are a company uh, focusing on development for primary mitochondrial disease with novel compounds. Uh, so I will give just a brief update on the clinical trial status for our compound KL1333. Let's see. Let's see. So that's how the compound looks like. And... K1333 is designed to correct uh, the redox status of a molecule called NAD, which is critical for normal energy metabolism. So specifically, K1333 modulates the ratio of NAD plus and NADH by being a recyclable substrate of an enzyme called NQ01, which you can see in the middle of this slide. And with that, K1333 K1333 functions as an alternative NADH oxidase when normal mitochondrial NADH oxidation is insufficient and reduced. So in a small phase one study, which was completed last year, we saw promising signals of improvements in both fatigue and in muscle function in mitochondrial disease patients. And as these symptoms, as most of you know, are very common and also have a heavy influence on the ability to live a, a normal uh, daily life, we decided to continue focusing on these two symptoms in the late stage clinical trials. So the FALCON study, as we call it, this is also a registrational study, uh, some of the other trials that are ongoing. Uh, this study has just started. And the study is investigating whether k one triple three improves fatigue levels and physical abilities of people living with mitochondrial disease. So this study is recruiting adult patients with, with chronic fatigue and mitochondrial myopathy. And study participants will be treated with k one triple three or matching placebo uh, for 48 weeks. And it's a small tablet taken twice daily. The study will have two primary endpoints. Uh, 
a mitochondria disease specific fatigue questionnaire, which we have specifically developed and validated for mitochondria disease. And the 30 second, sit to test, 30 second sit to stand test, which will evaluate the strength and endurance of uh, the lower extremities. We will also have several secondary endpoints looking at other important aspects of mitochondrial disease. And the uh, location so far, two sites have been activated over the last two weeks. So Cambridge in UK, England, and Copenhagen in Denmark. And we expect a lot of sites to be activated in January, February, after the holidays, including a couple of, of US sites. So in Houston and at, at Akron. The study has an adaptive study design. So we will start with including 40 patients. Then there will be a blinded uh, sample size reassessment to determine the final study size. So with that, I would just like to uh, uh, invite you all to join us to move forward uh, as we evaluate new uh, treatments for mitochondrial disease. This is a really important time with a lot of exciting trials ongoing. So. Let's uh, get all these trials recruited and we have a good opportunity to have exciting new treatment options available, hopefully. So happy holidays, everybody. Thank you so much, Magnus. Our last speaker of today's session is Fabian Summers, Head of Global Clinical Development at UCB. Thank you very much, Amel. Um, can I have my presentation, please? Yep, next slide, please. And thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present today um, on um, timidine kinase 2 deficiency and, um, and DOCS-TM. Um, well, I think we can move on to the next slide. Disclosure, usual. Um, so timidine kinase 2 deficiency or TK2D in short is a, recent, is a somewhat recent and recently discovered uh, condition, which was first described. The first TK2D patient was described in 2001. And rapidly after that, as uh, the science was progressing with uh, models being developed and the condition being better understood, new modalities of treatment started to be investigated. And that's what led to the investigation of DOCS-TM as a potential treatment for the condition of timidine kinase 2 deficiency. And as you can see from this slide, DOCS-TM has a very interesting um, history. It went through a number of companies, but the thing that has never changed um, is the commitment uh, of those different companies, and now UCB, the commitment of UCB to advancing DOCS-TM and bringing it as a uh, potential treatment for patients with timidine kinase 2 deficiency. Next slide, please. So what is TK2D? What is timidine kinase 2 deficiency? Well, it is a mitochondrial disease that um, manifests due to an issue, a problem with the um, uh, number of DNA copies of mitochondrial DNA. And so as a consequence of um, less timidine kinase 2 being present, the duplication process of uh, the mitochondrial DNA is impaired as a consequence of which too little DNA exists, is available, and therefore in, over the long run, there is a depletion in mitochondria. Less mitochondria means less energy for the cell, and therefore it is no surprise that the first cell that will uh, suffer, that will express uh, symptoms, are the one consuming large amount of energy including the uh, muscular cells. Um, next slide, please. If we look more into the details of uh, the clinical course of TK2D, um, we can very rapidly see that TK2D is a, a very debilitating, um, often life-threatening condition that um, cause a progressive uh, and severe muscle weakness that eventually can lead to uh, respiratory insufficiency, which is often the cause of a premature death. The clinical course of uh, TK2D is quite consistent across the different age group. 
Um, even though different phenotypes have been characterized, um, the, uh, depending on when the first symptoms uh, manifest in life. The diagnosis is ascertained on the basis of um, uh, genetic testing and confirmation of the presence of uh, a known um, uh, genetic abnormality. Um, and the symptoms, as we, um, as we just discussed, mostly center around a very severe muscle weakness and involve the loss or the, the inability to acquire important milestones related to um, uh, physical development, eventually leading to respiratory insufficiency and often premature death. Um, as often as it is often the case in, uh, in mitochondrial disease, um, misdiagnosis is a, is a real issue. And so one of the things next to progressing DOCS-TM, one of the things that is also very important for us to do is to work with um, uh, organizations such as the UMDF to also help push forward a better knowledge of the condition, a better diagnosis of the condition. Next slide, please. Now, in the context of uh, TK2D, what is DOCS-TM and how does it work? So DOCS-TM is a mixture of two naturally occurring nucleosides, uh, which, we off, which we call doxycytine and doxryctine. Those two nucleosides are key components in the buildup of new DNA. They are two of the bases that will be used for the purpose of building up new DNA. So upon delivering um, DOCS-TM, upon delivering DT and DC, molecules will find a way into the cells where they can be incorporated into um, the mitochondria and where they can participate to the buildup of new mitochondrial DNA, hence um, helping to restore a more normal uh, cellular function, eventually leading to an improvement in clinical symptoms. Um, next slide, please. Now, where do we stand? Clinical development of DOCS-TM is complete. The clinical studies that will support the uh, upcoming submissions are complete. Um, we are in the process of having a number of conversations with EMA, the European Medicinal Agency for Europe, NFDA, uh, in the United States for the purpose of finalizing the contents of the uh, global submissions um, of DOCS-TM to EMA and FDA. Our commitment is really to finalize the, the development of DOCS-TM as a treatment for patients with TK2D globally, hence the conversation with the two key uh, uh, agencies, but also as we just discussed, to support the mitochondrial uh, uh, disease community and patient association. And through those uh, conversations with EMA and FDA, prepare for a timely global submission of DOCS-TM um, to those respective agencies. Um, and I think this is my last slide. So now is a good time for me to thank everyone uh, for your uh, attention today. And once again, the UMDF for having invited me on behalf of UCB. Thank you so much, Fabien. And I would like to thank all our speakers today and congratulations on all your programs. We are very hopeful when hearing all of these programs that the field is really moving forward and will hopefully get to that therapy that we all seek. And for those who are not familiar with clinical trials, it takes a lot of effort to get these off the ground and going. So really a big thank you to all these teams that are working so hard to get us to that cure. Um, Phil, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that was one of the key takeaways uh, for me was that uh, a lot of effort goes into planning these trials, executing these trials. None of them can be successful absent patients. And we really can't stress that enough. It's a very personal decision. It's a very selfless decision to participate in a clinical trial. But to do that is perhaps not to your own benefit, but to both other patients and future mitochondrial disease patients. And so uh, we 
we really need your involvement. Please take advantage of the tools that we talked about at the beginning of the seminar on the UMDF site. If you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to UMDF. Um, but really, a decision to participate in a clinical trial is one that should take place as a discussion between patient and their healthcare provider. And uh, hopefully, Mel, you would agree with that. Yes, definitely. And I would urge uh, all my colleagues and, and other uh, physicians on the call to really talk about these clinical trials to their patients and encourage them to seek more information. And you are welcome to um, contact any of the sites on clinicaltrial.gov, call the coordinators and the PIs and ask questions. We are all very happy to answer these questions. And please do engage with us because we really need to get these trial in, trials enrolled to, to get to the FDA and get it approved. Yeah, and the full knowledge that there is even more coming, right? Uh, more, more exciting uh, uh, approaches and mechanisms of action, addressing different forms of mitochondrial disease. So we have to build that momentum, uh, that culture of clinical trials. A great starting point is to join our patient registry, MitoShare. You'll be made aware of any clinical trials that are relevant to you. Um, and from there, uh, we, we just have to keep uh, moving these things forward. So, um, Amel, I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for your uh, co-moderation today. Uh, also add my thanks to uh, all the speakers that uh, participated uh, today. Uh, I would like to take a moment to thank the patients that have participated in mitochondrial disease clinical trials. Again, that's a very selfless decision, and we're very appreciative of it. I uh, would like to thank everybody that attended today and is, is watching. And last but not least, happy holidays and a very happy new year to you all. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Phil, and happy holidays, everyone.